You're believing God for clarity. You're believing God for direction. You're believing God for a word. You're believing God for something tangible this morning. Let me see your hands. Surely God will grant your heart desire. And your expectation will be exceeded. Say with me in the name of Jesus. The Lord delights in me. And it will surpass my expectation. Let the believer in the house shout a big amen. amen. Today I'm going to share with you on a title I have called, on a topic of called Arrival of the Kingdom and the Journey to the Throne. Arrival of the Kingdom and the Journey to the Throne. Okay, we're there. Now let's start with this story. How many people in secondary school you have these books where the, que the, question, the answers are at the back? Every chapter there are questions. You have those books. I'm sure they still have those books now. For our mathematics, for our English. And then even in the primary schools, the quantitative and the verbal aptitude, the answers are at the back. But where are the questions? In the front. So... I want to use that as an example of what I want to explain this morning. The Bible is like a book with answers at the back. So that if you start at the back, you find the answers, but you don't know what the questions are. If you stop halfway through, like you stop in the Old Testament, then you have the questions, but you don't have the answers. So it is said then that um, for you to be a thoroughbred believer, what should you do? You must read the whole Bible. You must be able to link the questions to what? To the answers. And that's one of the things I'm going to be doing with us today. So let's start the journey. We said arrival of the kingdom. So I'm dividing this message into two. I'm going to talk about the arrival of the kingdom and then the journey to the throne. Because I want us to sit on the throne. Because that is when we can exercise our dominion mandate. I want us to sit on the throne as kings that we are. In the book of Luke chapter 1, that's where we're going to start our journey from this morning. Luke chapter 1. If you are there, say amen. We read verse 30. Luke chapter 1 verse 30. Good. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Jump to verse 32. It will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will be, will give him the throne of his father David. Can you see an answer there and a question? We would see the throne of David in the Old Testament. And here we see a fulfillment of that prophecy now being said, being reeled out to Mary. It will be great and will be called the son of the most high God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And it will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never End. So I'm talking about the arrival of the kingdom. What is that kingdom? Where is it? Now, if you look at Mark chapter 9, I'm trying to build on something. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death. This is Jesus talking to the people that were literally standing with him. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. That means some people that were standing with Jesus, they actually saw and experienced the kingdom. To some here standing with me, just like I say, some people here standing with me will see that this road will be done. And then in a month's time, we see the road being done or completed. And then it will be written in the chronicles of the capstone. That's the same way. Jesus said, some of you looking at me face to face like this will not see death until you see the kingdom arrive in power. Somebody said the kingdom has already come. How did I know that? We're going to go on again. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're jumping a bit because I have quite a few things to do. Acts chapter 1, we, look, we read from verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, 
but in the few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Don't forget I had told them that some of you will not die and you will see the kingdom. Now they said, you have already died. <laughs> we narrowly missed you. Thank God you resurrected. And we can see that we're not sure what your, you have talked about the, the parable of Jonah. Anything can happen to you. Are you going to restore the kingdom? Then he said, he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or dates the father has set for his own authority, but you will receive power. Somebody shout power. power. Say, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. Immediately Jesus told them that. They stayed. They tarried. They started waiting. Because something is about to happen. Immediately that Holy Spirit comes. Power comes. Kingdom comes. Immediately. And we saw the demonstration of that Pam right in Acts chapter 2. I will just read. Um, let's read one verse. Verse 38. Peter replied. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Immediately Peter received the gift of the Holy Spirit and all the other 120 people, they received power. That's how when pastor was sharing that they were speaking to 3,000 people without microphone. Somebody say power. They were healing the sick, the blind, the lame, power. That Holy Spirit has been given to you. That kingdom was released on that day. Do you know why? Two kings do not reign in the same territory. You know that. At least you are Africans. Now that the Alafi of Oyo, kings don't die as Wajad. As Wajad. They would have to bring another king. But up until the time when he exited, how dare you? That would be what? Treason. So the Lord reigned in heaven and created another kingdom for us on earth. And he sent us here so that we could rule. When Adam and Eve sinned, they did not fall from heaven. They fell from the rulership and dominion that was given to them. So Jesus came not to restore them back to heaven. What did he come to restore them to? To the rulership, to the government, to the authority that they lost when they sinned. So when he was exiting, he says, wait, the moment I leave, there is a governor from heaven. He will come. And this time around, he would not have his headquarters in Jerusalem or in Lagos or in Astorok or in White House, D.C. He would have his headquarters where? In you. The reason you are still acting like an ordinary citizen is because you don't understand that you are a carrier of God's kingdom. You are an ambassador of the Most High. The same power and authority that Peter had, you have it. It is not the exclusive of the bishops and the popes and the pastors and the evangelists. It is for every believer. Once you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you take a step and bring in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, you are too powerful. Somebody said the kingdom is here. That is number one. I said I'm going to talk about the arrival of the kingdom. And I want you to know that the kingdom has already arrived. Stop playing with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just to help you when we go to church and good worship is going on for you to have goose pimples. It's one of the things. It's one of the things, but that's not all. When you have the goose pimples, what then happens? You're supposed to hear something. You're supposed to hear a direction. 
You're supposed to hear instruction. You're supposed to stand up from there. When I lay hands on you and you fall down on the anointing, when you stand up, what do you hear? What do you do? Or do you come back next week and fall down again? And next week and fall down again? The kingdom comes in power. And that power resides in you. How many people here listening to me are baptized in the Holy Spirit? You're baptized in the Holy Spirit? Look at you. You are dynamite. We're going to go somewhere now. So how do you now go to the throne? Because you were born as a king. You were born as a king right from the foundation. The moment you gave your life to Jesus, you are a king. So how? Why are you walking like a peasant? Why are you walking like an ordinary subject? If you are already a king, how? Let me tell you something. The mere fact that you were born in Nigeria, your parents were illiterate, or they struggled, or your, something happened, um, you were living in a rented house, the landlord sent your father house, you were embarrassed growing up, those are all happenstance. The real issue is, even though Jesus was born in a manger, he came as a king. The incident of your birth should not define who you are. That's what we're saying today. Enough. So let's go. So how then do you get to the throne? Number one, today, there's something you must do. Because most of us have derailed from our, uh, uh, the navigation to uh, the throne. So we're coming back. What should you do, number one? Cultivate a heart for God. Today I want to raise all of us here to stand as kings. And even if all of us will not, I need like four or five people that will join me so that we can go and occupy a seat in the palace. Hello, somebody. So what's number one? Cultivate a heart for God. What do I mean? Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 13. That will make it easy. There were two kings mentioned there. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said to Saul. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler over his people. I'm looking for people whose heart will be for God. Saul didn't know anything. The people wanted a king. God chose Saul. God anointed Saul. But Saul's heart was not after God. And so God dethroned him and anointed another person in place. There are many Saul's today that have been dethroned. And God is looking for David. Say to me, say, say, say with me, He has found me. Can I have a David in the house? Can I have a David in the house? Say it like you mean it. He said, your kingdom will not endure anymore. I have found your neighbor. A man after my own heart. You need to. If you want to get to that throne, I don't care how far away you've been from it. The moment you realign your heart with God's, then God is coming for you. Because that's what he's looking for. That's the ingredient he's looking for. That is what is missing. A man after God's heart. I said, David is choosing to be king because he has what God, what Saul does not have. A heart for God. And God is looking, he's sorting, he's looking for men and women that have a heart for him. You know, when Samuel got to the place, got to Jesse's house, you know what he was looking for? Appearance. Charisma. You understand? He was looking for affluence, stature. So I don't care if you are deprived of those things. Maybe they have even called you ugly. They have called you, you know, poor. They have given you a stigma or a label that is not yours. Those things will not matter. Do you know what you need? A heart. A heart. So today what you're going to say is, Lord, as the deer pants after the water brook, so my heart and my soul longs after you. Only you will I seek after. I desire to do your will. Colossians chapter 1 should be your watchword from verse 9 to 12. 
Fill me, Lord, with the knowledge of your will through all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Help me to live a life worthy of you, fully pleasing you. Pray, pray. And if you have committed any sin, ask God to forgive you. There is therefore now no condemnation. Don't let anything stop you. We want to get to the throne. In a country like Nigeria, it's very, very easy to commit plentiful sins. In fact, some you know, some you do not know. You are just in the sin and you have found yourself there. They say everybody is changing their date of birth. You change. Because um, the bank say you must, only people under 26 must apply for entry level. At 19, jam did not jam you. The jam jammed you only at 24. How can you graduate at 26 for God's sake? So what do you, what do, you do? You have gone. You have changed something. You have sinned. Say mercy, Lord. A place where everything is just working against you. So you are in constant compromises. And so you feel condemned all the time. But the Bible says he forgives iniquity, he forgives transgressions. He reserves mercy for thousands. He said, come for I will abundantly forgive. Come for I will abundantly pardon. If your sin be as red as scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Don't let anything stop you. We need the heart for God. Because we want to get to where? The throne. And the devil stays by the corner and keep accusing you. You? Are you not a liar? Did you not steal? Did you not cheat? Did you not do this? Say, Lord, they are all nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. The blood of Jesus speaks. It speaks. It speaks mercy. The blood of Abel cries vengeance. But the blood of Jesus says what? Mercy. Somebody say mercy. And if you will cry to him sincerely today, he will forgive you. And when you come back tomorrow and say, God, say, I didn't remember that. Because when he forgives, he forgives totally. When it's not like human beings. If you offend me, I'll forgive you. Offend next week, I'll remember. That's human beings for you. But for, God doesn't do that. That's why he's God. Merciful Father. Just and faithful. So, a heart for God. Number two. Number two. We want to get to the throne, right? Be being filled. I don't know. I'm not looking in the direction of um, Staffy because she'll come and correct the English. Be, be, be being filled by the Spirit of God. And I will tell you what I mean by that. Can you imagine? The people that made my style, they did not put my English. They corrected it. They corrected it. Meanwhile, I wrote the bad one there. <laughs> what am I saying? You can't be filled once. The reason you are not moving to your palace is because you got filled when you gave your life to Christ and you stopped. You know, when we, when we go for training, you know, management training, they would say that vision leaks. So every once in a while, three years, four years, Companies will take their senior executives on a retreat and they will recast the vision on them because they need to be being filled. They need to be continuously filled. You were filled when you gave your life to Christ. You leaked when you went out yesterday. So you need to be filled again. That is why you need to wire yourself up. I say to people, hey, the days we are are so toxic. You need to find ways to put, you know, worship, prayer in your iPad, on your iPod, in your, you know, in your car, everywhere, you know, in the toilet. Just, I mean, two or three days ago, I was telling pastor, I said, we need to have surround in all over the house. So that when you wake up, you charge the atmosphere, you know. You know that time we were praying in the spirit for about two weeks. When I wake up and I'm not able to pray, I'll just be playing it. Once I play it, after like 10 minutes, the atmosphere changes for me. Then I'm able to pray. You need to be continuously filled. Don't stop at the day you gave your life to Christ. 
Don't stop at the days of the secondary school and the university when we had all the time and energy to pray. Now, when there is no time and there is no energy, you need to create the strategy to be filled. Somebody say be filled. That's the only way. If not, you will build Ishmael. If not, you will create Nehushtan. You will use the revelation that God gave you last year. You will use it for the strategy of today and it will fail. The same strategy that worked became an abomination. You will use the this, this strategy of conquering Jericho to conquer I and you will fail. So a lot of us are defeated and we're saying it's not working. This church thing is not working. I have given, given, given. I have prayed, 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 prayed. They say fast, 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 fast. I have done everything. It's not working. Do you know why it's not working? Because we were using the weapon that God ordained five years ago for today. Five years ago, he says, speak to the wall. Today, he is saying, she don't look. Next tomorrow, what he's saying is run away. There are different strategies for different warfare. How do you know? Unless you're filled. Unless the Holy Spirit speaks to you. How? Daily. Not daily. Per second, per second. So what worked in the morning will not work in the afternoon. You know, you travel. Let's say you live in Ikorodu every day. And what's the normal route to Ikorodu? Get to Ikorodu Road and drive straight. And then one day, as you got to the, you know, to the intersection, God says to you, go straight to Shagamu and enter Korodu through the back. Uh-uh. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. That could only have been God, right? And then you obeyed. And sometimes we obey God and go through Shagamu to Korodu and see nothing. No news. It doesn't mean that it wasn't God. Hello, somebody. Because how we come and give testimony in church is this. And then the Holy Spirit led me and said, go through Shagamu and I drove all the way two hours instead of a 30 minutes journey I made it two hours you know and then I just heard that a tanker fell on the Korodu road so we are saying that the only reason that that was justifiable was because a tanker fell sometimes nothing will fall but you will know that God led you that way you know what he's doing he's teaching you how to hear him it's teaching you how to obey when it is not convenient. The author of our salvation lent obedience. How? By the things he suffered. The Bible says Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And there he fasted 40 days and there he was tempted. He was led into temptation. There is no other way to walk with God outside of obedience to the Holy Spirit I want you this morning to recommit yourself to the Holy Spirit say my governor my captain my director Holy Spirit lead me say I'm pliable in your hands I'm willing I'm obedient I will eat the good of the land now talk to the Holy Spirit he's right inside of you he's right there don't ask him for money now don't ask him for food don't ask him for anything just, I just, I want to obey you. I want to hear you. I want to sharpen my tentacles to hear you better. We want to get to the throne. We don't want to struggle. I mean, look at the lives of David and Saul. The lives of David and Saul make it crystal clear that if you want God's will, we must be filled. Saul was once filled. But he lost it. At the end of Saul's life, do you know what he was consulting? Mediums. He went to the witches. The same witches that when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he sent them out of town. So many of us are going back to those things that we used to do. We're going back to our vomits. Saul was filled once. David was filled continuously. You need to be filled continually. David was anointed the same way Saul was anointed. But the anointing of David endured. The Christ life in you will endure in the name of Jesus. I said without the spirit we are powerless to fulfill the role that God has called us. 
The Spirit of God enables us to obey. The Bible says if we walk with the, in the Spirit, we will not gratify or fulfill the desires of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. And the presence of the Spirit in us helps us to build the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 23. So I want you to pray again, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, that you will be filled with the Spirit. Let it be your prayer all this week, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. When you wake up tomorrow morning, when you are trying to pray, even if you're going to pray for just five minutes, let the first, the chief of your prayer be what? Holy Spirit, fill me again. Fill me afresh. Fill me afresh. I mean to be sensitive to your directions today. In the name of Jesus. Lesson number three. Fight your fear. Fight your fear and fear the Lord. Now we read about David and Goliath in 1 Samuel, I think 16 or 17. And we think that that is just all. David and Goliath, like an incident, something that happened, Pam. Listen to me. There is a Goliath in your life every day. Who is the Goliath? Is the auto suggestion of the Philistine. Sister Joker shared, shared it. Who keeps saying to you something contrary to what God has said to you? He keeps reminding you of your incapabilities. Reminding you of your weaknesses. Reminding you of the things that, you know, can easily, sins that can easily, you know, beset you or make you fall. Reminding you of your deficiencies. That is Goliath. How can someone come like this and say to someone as little as this, you know definitely you don't have the capacity. There's a Goliath every day in your life. You need to keep fighting it. You need to keep saying to the Goliath, who are you to talk to the child of the Most High God? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When you turn 40, on your 40th birthday, I was speaking to a young lady who turned 40. And she said, Pastor Fumi, I thought I would be married at 30. Say, I'm 40. And there is no man inside. What did I do? I, of course, yes, I'm not the ugliest person. I said, you're not ugly. I said, I'm not the ugliest person. I said, no. If we want to put it right, uglier people have married. <laughs> it's not about ugliness or beauty. It's for you to know that God has tattooed your name in the palm of his hands. And he's daily thinking of how to do you good. And the thought that he has towards you are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Fight your fear. If you do not fight it, it will hinder you from getting to the throne. And let me tell you something. I don't know when. I may not know when. I may not know how. But he'll do it again. I may not know when. One thing gives me hope. There is a woman that was 65 years. She had never married. One day... A man came to her and said, will you be my wife? And today, she is married. I'm not saying you would wait till 65. But what I know is, God is the master planner. And he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Don't allow the things that you do not have hinder you from getting to where he wants you to go to. Because sometimes... The, that, that situation will not move until you get to the palace. Somebody said the journey to the palace. So what's number three point? Fight your fear. If you know how to write those things that you fear down, write them down. Then you know the way, to, the, the antidote to that is like when the snake bites you. You go and take the venom of the snake and put it. Take the word of God. The fear comes through the things that are suggested into our brain. They come, you are too fat, you are too short, you are too tall, you didn't go to school, ah, you are osu. You know, all those things will come to you, then you know you're not saying back. This is what the word of God has said concerning me, you know. Whoever is in Christ is a new creature. 
all things are passed away. All things have become new. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, it's because you, are, you have a child outside wedlock. You had a child at 16, so you will never have a, 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 a husband. You know, you don't say to the person, no, 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 no. As far as the north is from the south, so are my sins far away from me. You understand? There is therefore not. You know, you say those things and you stand. So fight your fear. And fear the Lord. Now, how do you demonstrate that you fear the Lord? By exalting his word above everything. It doesn't matter what has been said. What has the word of God say? say? What did the word of God say? The word of God is the final authority over every situation. The final authority. What has he said? What has he said? Number four. Hmm. This one. And, you know, I was looking at all the th teachings we've had this month, the heart and mouth connection. That's where you use the fear of God over the fear of man. When we heard about the Goliath, it's not just one incident. It happens every day. That fear comes every day. And if you do not submit to the Holy Spirit, you will use carnal weapons and it will destroy you. Use the weapons that you have proven and that's the word of God and your fellowship. Now, number four, God uses humans to connect the dots that lead you to the throne. He uses humans. What does God use? Humans. Brother David spoke extensively on this. That's why I told him he was preaching my message. So I will just, I will gloss over it. And I'll tell you what it means. There are so many people in the life of David I would explain a little bit about the significance of these people. For you to get to the throne, you need a brother. You need a brethren. Jonathan was David's friend. You need someone that's got your back. You need someone that would stand for you. You need someone that is committed to your well-being. You can't do it alone. How many people watch um, action movies, thrillers? You would always notice they would Show us one macho man. But then, there will be someone, one girl that he had connected, you know, when he was buying coffee. And when he threw the javelin, that girl would just hold the javelin and keep it. And they are, ah, ah, actor Ukusha. <laughs> you always need someone. You need someone. Don't act as if you can do it on your own. Your prayer should be, who is that person? Who is my Jonathan? Who is my Jonathan? You need a Jonathan. You need a Saul. Ah, huh? who needs Saul? You need Saul. Let me tell you something. All of you listening to me, you always need a boss. A bad boss and a good boss. Why do you need a Saul in your life? Saul was a king that was dethroned. David was a king Whose dynasty is supposed to end forever? I mean, it's not supposed to have an end. It's supposed to be continuous. There must be something in Saul that made God to dethrone him. So when you are in the house of Saul as a David, God is teaching you all the things not to do. Somebody say, I need a Saul. So that boss, that had senior, that prefect, that person is necessary for you. You're, going, you're supposed to learn some things. You don't have it there. And you can see how David demonstrated that when he had problems with Solomon, um, with um, Absalom. All the soul in David had been killed. Bitterness, viciousness. He, he, all of them have been dealt with. So when he had to deal with Absalom, he was just saying, deal gently with the young man, Absalom. Because I know anyone that fights authority will succeed. <laughs> I fought authority by the word of God. I succeeded. But if you fight authority in carnality, you will lose. I don't care even if you are right. Because every authority has been placed there by God. Are you listening to me? If you fight authority, you will lose. Let me say this in Yoruba. Tony Lebagba, I want to you. Ale jo ni olo. Ta le jo ba gba yawo onile. A 
And then you know the old law. Somebody should interpret that. If the landlord takes the wife of the tenant, the tenant will go. If the tenant takes the wife of the landlord, the tenant will still go. It's not fair. What I'm saying is, be careful. If you fight authority, you will lose. God will be against you. Everything will be against you. David had to be in the house of Saul to learn that. So when Absalom was rebelling, you know what he was doing? He was praying for him. Because he knew that no one does it successfully. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know how many years David, I was trying to study, they said he was like pre-adolescent. They are not sure about his age. So we put the age to between 10 and 15. But he did not become the king of Judah until 30. Let's take a mean of that. So for 17 and a half years, thereabouts, you knew you were already anointed as king. God said it. Samuel said it. Jonathan said it. Even Saul said it. Yet, Saul wanted to kill you. And you had the opportunity three times to kill him. And you did not. A lot of us would prevent ourselves from getting to the throne because we killed the Saul in our life. Somebody said, don't kill Saul. There would never be a justification. God put him there. Let God kill him. You can't kill Saul. You need the dots. So Saul taught David patience. Saul taught David perseverance. Taught, taught David to watch over the word of God and make it come to pass. God taught, taught David to rely not on his strength but on the Holy Spirit. All these lessons he would not have learned with Jonathan. Jonathan can only give him still food from the palace and give to him. There are some things your friend will do to you. There are some things your enemies need to do to you. Am I talking to someone? Do you want to get to the palace? Somebody say, I need Saul. You've been waiting and you've been running around. You have surrounded yourself only with David. You won't get to the throne. Until what? You serve under Saul. You need a Samuel. You need spiritual authority. If you read Revelation, the first few chapters that we talk about, the angel of the church of Laodicea writes, you need someone to run to when you want to cross-check what God is saying. You need your Samuel. It will never go out of vogue. God put five in place. Prophets, apostles, pastors, evangelists, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints. Until we come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Until we come to the place where we rule. You need, you don't, you don't have a choice. So well, that's why I tell people, if you are online, you better have an online pastor. Are you listening to me online? You better have an online pastor that you go to. Because you need Samuel. Hello, somebody. You need Ahimelech. <coughs> Ahimelech the priest. That's what all those casual counseling does to us. They will tell you once in a while and bring you back. A lot of people are living on Ahimelech. It's like living daily on ice cream. You're living on waffles. But you know what parents do? They will give you vegetables. I remember those days when we had to start eating salad by force. It was difficult. That thing is not sweet. They will put avocado. They will put chicken. Avocado, I don't like. Chicken, I don't eat. You know what I used to do? When I knew that I needed those vegetables, when they served the vegetable, my boy or Bessie, I'll just carry stew. Put it on top. On my salad. You know what my children say? Mommy, you're not eating salad. You're eating salad. You got the name. I got the food. And I have the nutrients. 
So when they are eating their food, I take the oil on top of the stew. You know, I just carry it in, spread it as my salad cream, and I'll be eating the thing. Can't you see? Do I look good? Do I look healthy? It's called salad. You can eat your salad. I eat my salad. The most important thing is all the nutrients that you are eating. Me too, I'm what? Eating it. You don't live your life just with Abimelech who will tell you one good word once in a while. We need the good word. Okay? Because sometimes it's really rough. You need a good word. But you can't live on that. You don't feed your child on ice cream. You tell your child you need salt. Go back. You tell your child, go back. Ah, mommy, go back. You're not living until the sin of the Amorites are full. Go back. You know, then you'd get to some dangerous spots. You know, when David got to the king of Gath, you know what he did? He acted like a madman. You need to read this. It's interesting. There are some situations. You will call, you will not hear God. You will search, you will not see him. You have to devise a means. Because you know that there's a destination for you. He looked, he, he looked around, he didn't see anything. Ha, if I get here, you know the king of God, they are the Philistines. They will kill him. They will use like armor. You know what he did? He acted like a madman. Uh, 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 so that he would escape them. You need the dots. Somebody say you need the dots. You need people that will help you. He went to the king of Mizpah in Moab. They helped him to keep his parents. He was still responsible for his family. He said, help. I'm still in the midst of war. Help me. They helped to keep his parents. I'm, I'm bringing this out for you to put the dots in your life and see what state are you in now. Are you on the saw now? Are you with Abimelech now? Are you Abimelech now? Do you need to be sending some subvention to your parents? Is someone helping you do that? You need that. It's part of the things you need. Because the Bible says, honor your parents. Honor your father and your mother. It's the first commandment with a promise. So that your days may be long, so that you can be on the throne. Many of you have thrown your parents. You will shorten your stay on the throne. You may not even get there. Because they will curse you and it will come to pass. Hello, somebody. You need prophet God. You know, the prophet gave him a few instructions. Here and there, you need that. At different times. That's why you need to continually study the word of God. You can read. I should give you some scriptures. 1 Samuel 19, 1 to 17. 1 Samuel 19, 18. 1 Samuel 21, 1. You need, 1 Samuel 19, 1 to 17 is a story of um, Micah. You need a good spouse. And then as a spouse, please do not, do not, do not look down on your spouse. See, finish can kill you as a spouse too. And as much as Micah was the one that saved David when Saul was going to kill him, the same Micah despised David when David was dancing before God. Everyone that was barren in the Bible. Everyone. Go and study. Our children. Except the ones that have issues. Chief of them was? What? Who? Micah. Because there shall be none barren in the land. Is the word of the principle of God. But Micah despised. Now, when Micah was despising David... She just was not despising her husband. She was despising the king of Israel. So spouses, be careful. Am I talking to someone? I'm talking about connecting the dots that lead you to the throne. So you need your Micah to help you. You also need your Micah to honor you. Don't despise your spouse. You will be offending God. Hello, somebody. Um, I talked about David and Kayla. David went to Kayla. Kayla was a fortress, was a fortified city. 
was a fortified city. And they helped him. But the moment Saul heard that David was in Kayla, David asked the Lord, the people of Kayla, will they hand me over? God said they will hand you over. Will they betray me? They will betray you. Let me tell you something. On the journey to the throne, betrayers will come. Envious people will come. They don't like you. They don't like you. And you'll be surprised and disappointed in the church. And we're all speaking in tongues. Yes, so they helped, they helped David. The same people. And God told him, Whoa. If you stay, they will betray you. They will throw you. So David ran. David ran. Remember, there is a time to fight. There's a time to run. Don't fight when God tells you to do what? Run. You know when to run. You know when to act like a mad person. Mojamosa. It takes you to the throne. So many of you are wounded today because you didn't know that you were supposed to run. Hello, somebody. And I was telling you, look at David, I mean, Joseph, in the house of Potiphar. He ran. I told you, if the tenant, if the landlord takes the wife of the tenant, who will still go? Tenant. He was still punished for nothing. But even though he slay you, don't stop praising him because he's taking you to the throne. Am I hearing amen from someone? Let's quickly jump to lesson five. Remember David and the Ziphites. More betrayals. David and Saul refusing to take vengeance. And then see what he did when God vindicated him. How he exalted the covenant he had with Jonathan. How he kept the lame son of Jonathan. Very important. So, the dots. Number five. Remember, on your journey to the throne, that is not your kingdom, it's God's kingdom. It's all for God and his kingdom. Do you understand? David was anointed just the same way Jesus was anointed. That is in 1 Samuel 16, 13. Because to be anointed in Hebrew is Messiah and in Greek is Christ. When they asked Jesus, when Jesus asked his disciple, who do men say that I am? They told him. Then they asked, who do you say? They said, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. The son of the living God. The same way I want to say to you today, you are the anointed one. You are the son of the living one. So everything that is happening to you is to make you to replicate the mercy and the grace and the power of Christ here on earth. I'm going to start running now. Now, I want to tie my dots now. I want to go to the back of the book and the front. Genesis chapter 49 verse 10. Why did David have to go through all this? Saul could not. Genesis 49 verse 10. It says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Narrow Sekedayaba. David became the king. This same scripture was said concerning him. But there is no human figure after David that is still on the throne. Let's look at the good ones. Ezekiah, Josiah. You understand? The greatest of them lived 70 to 80 years. None of them had an eternal kingdom. So this scripture in Genesis 49 is referring to Jesus and us. That's the answer at the back of the book. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until he, whom it belongs. Who does it belong to? Ma, 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 ma. Who does it belong to? Now, if you fail to go through the things that David went through, the way he went through it, you will be aborting prophecy. And you know what will happen? They will take you aside and raise another David. Until we find one that is willing to obey. Who will not kiss
Saul three times when he had the chance to. Who would run away and act mad. The Bible says pray for them that despisefully use you and persecute you. You don't take the gospel when it is convenient. You do the will of God. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. Now, number six, let me quickly, is the last one is number six. Learn to rule and reign for him. You have to learn to rule and reign for him. That is the whole essence of what I've taught today. I'm talking to men and women. Learn to rule and reign. For who? When it is about you. When it is about you. You understand? Immediately you start on this palace like this. Bam! That's when you discover that your wife, you married her as 36, 28, 40. And now she is 40, 40, 40. <laughs> then you now discover your secretary is 28, <laughs> 24, 36. Immediately. But when you are reigning for him, it kills you daily. You live only for him. Psalm 115 verse 16. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. It is not the dead who praises the Lord, those who go down to the place of silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. The highest heaven belongs to who? Where belongs to us? The earth. God is reigning in heaven. What does he want you to do? He wants you to reign on earth. Um, 1 John 4 verse 7. He said, as he is in the heavens of heavens, so are we here on earth. As God is reigning there, so are we here. But a lot of us have not qualified ourselves to receive the scepter. And that scepter is for us because he wants us to reign. That's why he gave the Holy Spirit. That's why he gave the Holy Spirit. I said the word reign in Greek is basileu, which means to rule as king from a foundation of power. To rule as king from the foundation of power that we received in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon us to rule as king. That is what God wants from us. And I'm not talking to men. I'm not talking, I'm not calling you queens, women. I'm calling you kings. He has made us a kingdom of kings and priests unto our God. The pertinent questions are, do you see yourself as a king and priest or do you see yourself as a sinner saved by grace? You are a sinner saved by grace, no doubt about that. But you must also see yourself as what? As king and priest. Do you see yourself, your, your righteousness as filthy rags? Isaiah 64 verse 6 or do you see yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? 2 Corinthians 5 21 Do you see yourself as grasshoppers and unable to go to the land? Or do you see yourself as well able? Numbers 13 33 I want you to know that nothing should stop you. I will stop with this scripture and then we'll take the communion. Romans chapter 6 verse 12 do not let sin reign therefore in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, lekura basanda, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I'm calling you this morning to a life of yielding. I'm calling you to a land of a land of a life of rulership. And I'm saying to you, God wants you to reign. God wants you to rule. I need just one, two, three, four, five people today who want to reign. You are obsessed with doing that because God has already anointed you. Stand to your feet. You don't need to, don't do bandwagon, don't stand because everybody's standing, please. 
I only need the people that want to say, you know what, God? I'm tired of struggling. How can you be the child of a king? And you are like this. Do you know how much dollar is today? People are scared. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. It will connect you to the dots of heaven. Because you can trace your DNA to him. He is your father and your God. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. The silver is his, the gold is his. He will turn around things for your good. If he can cause the ravens to feed Elijah, then there is nothing that he cannot do. The sons of the prophet, they borrowed an axe. They had axe head fed into the water. And they said, alas, it was borrowed. Is there someone in depth this morning? The Lord just gave that to me. Is there someone in depth this morning? You say, alas, it was borrowed. Then Elisha said, cut a piece of wood, threw it into the water. How do you throw wood into the water and the axe head will float? Because God wants you to reign. And borrowers are servants to the lenders. And he has made you a king. If you are in debt today, I want you to talk to God. Say, God, I just had your word. I just had your word right now. It's going to take you out. It's going to cut that piece of wood. It's going to ask you to throw it into the water. You have to listen for the instruction of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to float. Because you're not supposed to be a borrower. You are a lender. You will lend and not borrow. That is what the Lord says in Deuteronomy 28. If you obey the word of the Lord. So paraventure you have found yourself in a position of servitude. God is saying no I'm taking you up. Because you are a king. Do we have the communion element? Only kings. Only kings this morning. Take the bread. I want to read that Genesis 49 again. He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Say with me, the scepter will not depart from me. Nor ruler staff from between my feet. Until it comes to me. And the obedience of the nations shall be mine. That means the obedience of your sector will be in your hands. You become authority in your sector. The body of Jesus was broken for you so that yours will not be broken anymore. That's why we take the bread, remembering this. You take the cup. There's no condemnation in you. Rejoice. us do something this morning for just two minutes if you want a new direction in your life you want to step out for a new walk with God I want you to come here for about two minutes I just want us to tarry in God's presence just one or two people you want God to walk with you mm. it's just you and God I will not lay hands on you it's you and God See, I'm tired I don't want to do this struggle anymore the people that are up there want Lord Imeji. You want to talk to God by yourself? I want you to face God yourself. I'm giving you one more minute. Just you and God. My Somebody's connecting the dots. Somebody's connecting the dots. Somebody's connecting the dots today. My where are you? Are you with Saul? Are you in God? 
Are you with Misfa? Are you with Jonathan? Where are you? Where are you? Are you with Malika? Where are you? Settle it, settle it today. Settle it with God today.